Hallo lieve gemeente, ik groet jullie vanuit die Deacon Command Huis. En het is, het is een kostbaar om en een voorrecht om samen toch kerk te kunnen houden vandaag. En om met elkaar te kunnen deel. En uh, ik denk dat het, is, het is wonderlijk om met die technologie wat ons vandaag heet, om elkaar te kunnen zien. En uh, ja, als groet jullie vanuit ons huis hier, groet ons jullie allemaal. Ons kom kei weer allemaal een beetje bij jullie vandaag. Ik kom kei weer een beetje in jullie. Er zit kamers op jullie cellfone, op jullie rekenaarskermen, kom kei weer een beetje vanochtend. En uh, dat gebeurt niet weer. Nie. So, uh, dat is een interessante geleentheid. En uh, ja, ik groet jullie. Ik hoop het gaat goed met allemaal. Ik uh, weet, ik heb met een paar mensen uit de kerk al vandaag gepraat en samen gebed en ook de afgelopen dag contact gehad om te horen hoe gaat het met mensen. Hoe tref je die omstandigheden van mensen? Uh, met werk, naar de gezondheid, wat doen hulle bij die huis om te horen hoe gaat het en om elkaar te kan bemoedigen. En dat is belangrijk. Meer dan ooit het ons elkaar nodig. Ons kan elkaar niet nou zien of drukjes geven um, en uh, met elkaar in die oor kyk. Maar jullie kan mij niet oor kyk, maar ik kan jullie niet zien. Nie. Maar ja, om elkaar te bel, met elkaar te praten en te horen hoe gaat dit en hoe beleef je die dingen en hoe pas je jezelf op. En, um, ja, hoe spandeer je ook jouw geestelijke tijd? Hoe bemoedig je ons met elkaar? Zo, so, ik wil jullie aanmoedigen om dit te doen. Hier bij ons gaat het goed. Um, ik is vandaag positief getoetst op, op die virus. Maar ik voel verder heel ja, eindelijk gezond. En de rest van mijn gezin ook. Zoals so, is reeds uh, so week en een half nu in isolatie. En uh, ons plan natuurlijk om, om voor te gaan daarmee. Zoals so, ons gaan niet uit je huis, het gaan niet. Maar verder gaan het goed met ons, het is positief. Ons, uh, ons is lekker in die gang. Ik kan werk van die huis af. Ons doen homeschooling, zodat so het gaat heel goed bij ons. Ons is gezond verder en ons is, uh, ons is rustig. So, uh, ons is dankbaar voor die mensen wat gebed het uh, vroeger die week, toen ik aan het zit. So, uh, dankbaar daarvoor. En toen ik gebed het vandaag voor wat ik jullie mee kan bemoedig, um, voordat ik die woord met jullie deel. Er is twee versen uit bij mij in mijn gedachten gekomen dat ik met jullie wil deel. En die eerste een is in, in James, in Jacobus, vers 2 um, tot 5. En ik ga het veel lezen in het Engels. <coughs> Jacobus 2 vers 5, James, 2, James chapter 1 vers 2 to 5. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So as we see here clearly, as a Christian, as a kind of God, can we see any verzoeking, any toets, actually, can we see as a toets. En ons kan het zien als iets om dankbaar voor te wees, want ons weet die Heer is nooit uit beheerheid nie. En hij vormt ons op verschillende manieren. Hij vormt ons door met ons te praten, door die Heilige Geest in ons hart. En hij vormt ons door onze omstandigheden. Partijken is onze omstandigheden moeilijk en partijken is het beter. En in tijden zoals nu wanneer het moeilijk is, dan kan ons denken aan schriften zoals hier die. Waarin ons zien dat dit een goede ding voor ons is als gelovig is, want ons geloof wordt getoetst en als ons geloof sterker wordt dan um, bewerkt het in ons standvastigheid. En dat standvastigheid leidt ons om Jezus beter te leren kennen. En die belofte is ook daar voor wijsheid. Als enige ons van wijsheid kort in die tijd, en dat kan nog op enige vlak wees, dat kan wees, hoe bestuur je je financiën als je elke bezigheid hebt, hoe doe je dit? Um, hoe spande, wat soort wat dingen kan je met je kinders doen? In die tijd van lockdown, om drie weken samen te wees, wat, wat kan je leren? leer? Hoe kan je in hulle leven investeren op een manier wat je misschien nog niet van tevoren gedoen het? Die Heere beloof, hy gee wijsheid. En hij zal het niet doen om eerst te kijken of jij goed of slecht was nie. Hy sê, who gives generously without reproach. So, hy, hy het nie favorites nie, hy geef ons allemaal als ons omvraag. En dit is fantastisch. Die ander skrif wat ik met jullie wil deel, ook in die tijd is, Specifiek in die tijd wat ons so bij die huis zit en ons eigenlijk toch een beetje vastgevangen zit of daar kan voel, afhankelijk van je omstandigheden, um, is dat een ding wat niet vastgevangen kan worden. En het me laat denken aan dit wat Paulus gezegd toen hij aan Timotheus geschreven het, vanuit die dronk uit, naar Timotheus in Ephesius, 
in um, 2 Timotheus 2 vers 9. Hy sê, uh, in vers 8 sê hy, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. On a vertaling sê, the word of God is not in chains. En dis wat ek julle ook wil aan herinner, is dat die woord van die Heere is levendig, dit uh, wil, die Heere wil iets doen in ons leven in die tyd. En hy wil ons vorm, dat ons om meer lief het, dat ons om beter kan ken, maar ook dat ons die woord met mense kan deel. Daar is baie mense rondom ons nou wat taak hoopeloos is, wat vrees ken, wat nie die Heere ken nie, en hulle weet nie wat gaan gebeur met hulle nie, um, sou hulle siek word, of wat gaan gebeur, hulle gaan taak hulle werk verloor, wat ze hoop, het hulle nie die wereld. So ek wil hier die skrifte met julle deel als herinnering, om, om te bid, om die Heer te vraag vir wijsheid, en om sy woord te lees, om dit in, in te neem, so dat dit vir jou kan versterk. Oké, okay. so voordat ons gaan begin met die woord, gaan ek vir ons bid, en dan gaan ons, gaan ek die woord met julle deel. Ons so, dankie Heemse Vader, dat ons um, als een gemeente bij elkaar kan kom Heer. Ons weet dat die gemeente, Vader God, is die mensen wat u lief het wat geroep is om u kind te wees, wat gegloe het in u, en wie sy levens verander is, door die werk van u gees. En vader, ons dankie vanavond, vandag, dat ons vreugde kan vind, in u teenwoordigheid, dat ons vreugde kan vind, as ons u woord lees, en dat ons vreugde kan vind, en om mekaar te ken, en om mekaar op te bouwen, en mekaar te help herinner, aan die waarheid, en aan u, wat bestaan. En ek wil ook so bid, vader, vanavond, dat u woord, met kracht en waarheid, en sal werk, sal spreek, Heer, dat jy sal spreek, Heer, dat ons opgebouw, herinner, en bemoedig, en ook aangemoedig kan word, Heer, om jy te volg, Heer, en dit bid ek so in die naam van Jesus, Amen. Ok, um, I'm going to switch to English now, because most of you know, when I prepare, and when I um, bring the word, I do so in English, so put your English head on, Afrikaans head off, English head on, and uh, we're going to switch to English, okay. So, I want to share with you this today from the book of John, uh, John chapter 14, verse 1. But before I do that, um, I want to tell a little bit of a story. So, um, about three weeks ago, a couple of my best friends visited me from, from the Netherlands. Those are friends of mine that, I've, that I grew up with, and I know them from being being a teenager and we all got saved together as well, and they were my best men at my wedding, so people that are very close to me. But obviously being away from my home country now for about eight years, um, uh, the times I saw them became very few. So when we decided to, to meet up again, it was something I was looking forward to for a long time, for a number of months already. And it, it gave me energy, and I was looking forward to the time they were coming, and we had a, a special time together of encouragement, and fun, and praying together, and just, yeah, as good friends do, and it made me think at this time, people love having something that they look forward to, people almost need something that they look forward to, um, whether it's on a daily basis, whether you're looking forward to the first coffee of the day, or it's on a weekly basis, or you're looking forward to the weekend, or to the Sunday, or, or even when you're doing a hard thing, a chore, or homework, or something you don't enjoy doing, you give yourself almost like a reward, where you're saying, okay, I'm going to get through this, and when I'm done, I'm going to reward myself with something small. Um, and, and you give yourself something to look forward to. Something, even when you're not feeling well, and the doctor reassures you, you get hope from that. You get peace from that. And it gives hope, and hope gives life. And um, there are many people, even today, um, who try to give hope, who try to give some kind of a positive feeling or a positive experience for the future, something that people can look forward to. And, and even, and there's many sayings around that. Um, you know, after the rain comes the sunshine. Or um, the best view comes after the hardest climb. Or um, like Martin Luther King said, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. Well, that's a little bit deeper already. People, they crave hope. And a lot of these things maybe sound positive and they sound familiar perhaps, but what are they actually based on? What is the foundation of these beautiful sayings that actually really gives you hope so that 
you've got something to hold on to? What makes you confident that um, that when you hear these positive sayings, that they're actually built on something or someone that you can trust on? Or is it just a feeling that we can create at any time that doesn't really mean anything? Is it just a psychological thing that happens and it goes away again? Psychology today teaches that you can actually find hope almost as a chemical um, substance in your brain. But that you can only find it in yourself through meditation, by, by dwelling on things that you do well or you enjoy. Or you can find hope in other people around you. But the question is, what if everyone else around you is trying to do the same thing, finding hope in each other? Or what if the problem you're facing, that you need hope for, can't be solved by people? Something like a pandemic, something like a natural disaster, something like an eternal disaster, something like sin. How do we deal with these things? And what kind of hope do we have in these kind of times? Now for that, I want us to look at a, a profound piece of scripture uh, from the Gospel of John. And before I read out our scripture for today, I want to paint a little bit of a picture of where we are in the story of Jesus and particularly in the story of John. Uh, one of the main points from the Gospel of John that John is trying to make, or he starts with and that he ends with, is to prove to people, to everyone who reads the Gospel of John, he wants to prove to them that Jesus is the Son of God and that we need to believe in Him. Okay, so we're going to see that a lot of times during this message. And I've called the message a firm hope. Okay, so where we are in the story is that <clears throat> Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He's come to Jerusalem on a donkey and um, he has now had some conversations with people and he started to say some things which were different from what he was earlier saying earlier. He uh, started talking about himself and him dying. He started talking about him being lifted up on a cross. So the people started to see, hear a different kind of message from, from Jesus. And then what we see when we go into chapter 13 is we see Jesus um, leaving the crowds and going into a time alone with his disciples. They go into the upper room where they're trying, where they're going to have the the, the meal before Passover, the Passover meal, because it's Passover time. And sometimes referred to as the Last Supper. And Jesus uh, goes and washes the disciples' feet. So he shows them servanthood. He shows them that um, those who want to be the, the, the most important needs to be the least. We I think we know that story. And then he ends by talking about Judas, who's going to betray him, he ends by saying Judas is going to betray him and the disciples are confused. Why would this happen? And, and, and what kind of uh, narrative, what is happening to this whole story of Jesus becoming the king of Israel, him being the Messiah who is going to rule over the Romans? Where, where is this going? This is taking an unexpected turn in the story. And it gets even worse because Jesus starts saying um, to Peter, to the disciples, that he's going to leave. And then Peter um, says, and I want to read this to, to us in, in chapter 13, verse, verse 36 to 38. <clears throat> he starts talking about where, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. And this is confusing to them. So we'll pick it up in John 13, verse 36 to 38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So this is a message that they don't want to hear this. Jesus is going away. They can't follow him. They, they're going to deny him. Peter, the one of the most outspoken followers of Christ, is going to deny Jesus. This is very confusing to them. This is where we pick up the story. And what's going to happen now is that Jesus starts probably one of the most profound messages, sermons, teachings um, to his disciples, which stretches over three chapters. Okay, John chapter 14, 15, and 16. And it's profound. It's a message that's real. It's rich in comfort. It's rich in hope. It's rich in perspective. And it wasn't just for them. It was, it's also for today. It's even so profound and so real for people that 
Um, my grandmother, she memorized the whole of chapter 14. And it was a comfort to her own soul whenever she was in troubled times that she could remember these words of Jesus and it would help her to go through tough times. So we're going to read just one verse today because it's, it's, a it's big chapters, it's long chapters. Um, but we are going to look at one verse and then we're going to dip into the rest of the three chapters um, during, during our time together. Okay, so I'm going to read for us John chapter 14, verse 1. We're just going to read verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. This is Jesus' statement that he starts with. He just told the disciples that he's going away. He just told Peter, one of his most loyal disciples, that he was going to betray him. And now Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The disciples must have looked anxious. All of them. They must have looked distressed, troubled. And they were wondering what's going to happen. And Jesus is saying, let not your heart be troubled. What a strange thing to say for Jesus. Why would he say that? Because surely he, could, he knew and he could see on their faces that they were troubled. So he's saying, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And what's actually when you think about it, Jesus having to comfort the disciples. Well, he is the one who's going to face the most trouble in a very short space of time. We read in chapter 12 that Jesus is saying, my heart is troubled. I'm fearful. Yet, Father, let your will be done. Where he's thinking about his crucifixion. He's going to be crucified in the next 36 hours. And yet he is the one comforting his disciples. Now, Jesus is saying, let your heart, not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I want us to look at this almost as if Jesus is saying he's building an argument. He's trying to convince them. He's going to try and try say to them, guys, you don't have to be concerned. You don't have to be anxious. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to show you everything that you need to know so that your hearts don't have to be troubled anymore. So I'm gonna, we're going to look at that. A number of arguments of why Jesus is saying, don't be troubled in times of trouble. He's saying to the disciples, but it's in the same time it applies to us as well. Okay. What I want to start with is making sure we understand this verse well. Jesus is saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Okay, we get that. He's trying to say that to the disciples, and the disciples are probably not getting it immediately. Then he is saying, believe in God, believe also in me. But actually, the translation here is wrong, and it's quite important that we get it right, because it does take a different spin on what Jesus is saying. Your Bibles will probably say, believe in God, believe also in me. But the actual translation, how it's written down in the original languages and how it should be translated, and some of your Bibles might have a footnote that says that, it should say, you believe in God, believe also in me. Or where well, actually the point he's trying to make is saying, you already believe in God. That's what he's saying to the disciples because they were Jews. They believed in God. They believed in God. The God of Israel, the God of their forefathers, the God who was going to send the Messiah, the God of the Old Testament, that's the one they believed in. Now he is saying, believe also in me. This is a human being, the Son of God, to them saying, believe in me. Why do the disciples need to believe in Jesus? They already believe in God. Okay, Why, why do they need to believe in him? Isn't believing in God enough? So let's look at why Jesus is saying this. And one of the things I want to say that, about that before we go into the different arguments is it's easy to believe in God. Everyone, there's a lot of people who believe in God. Even the demons believe in God. The Jews, you know, there's many people who believe in God. But does that mean they know Him? Does that mean it gives them any comfort? Or does it just mean they believe it exists, but they don't do anything with it? Okay, so just think about that for a moment. We can believe in something, but it doesn't actually make a difference in our lives. And the point that Jesus is trying to make is, you don't have to be troubled in troubled times because you believe in me. And that's what he's saying. And he's, and he's putting that, his argument, his reason for the comfort is in himself, in his faith in Christ. Okay. Let's look at what he's promising. Let's look at what he's trying to communicate to them in the chapters that follow. And I'm going to give you Two types of arguments, two types of answers that, that Jesus has given, two types of reasons for why we can have faith in Him and it gives us comfort, hope, 
and peace in troubled times. One, the first one is for this life, and the second one is for the life to come. Okay. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, now believe also in me. One of the things that we see keep coming back in the chapters that follow, chapter 14, 15, and 16, is the concept of Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is the exact representation, the exact imprint of his nature, as we read in Hebrews 1, of the being of the Father. He is the only one who could be the, the, uh, could be a man on earth who could perfectly represent God the Father. And because of that, Jesus gives the promise three times of answered prayers. Now that's an interesting one because the Jews, the, the disciples as, as Jews, although they weren't schooled or anything, they would have probably prayed the Jewish type of prayers. They would have probably prayed three times a day as the forefathers would have prescribed them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, morning, afternoon, evening, and then on Shabbat, um, they would have also prayed with their families and when they went to the synagogue. But Jesus is talking about a different type of prayer. He's not talking about a prayer where the Jews would have many times prayed in a way just to praise God. But there would be no relationship. There would be no personal prayer of making requests, of making, um, yeah, asking for things, giving praise or thanks for particular things. Many of it would just be a recited prayer, something that they read from a book or something that they've learned by heart. But this is a different kind of prayer. And, and, and I want us to look at some of those promises. There is a promise of answered prayers by believing in Jesus Christ. Okay, Chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now what does this mean? What is this in relation to? Um, we see that Jesus is saying, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified. So first of all, Jesus is making it possible to pray now in His name. There is access to the Father by the name of Jesus, by believing in Him. But actually we need to go one verse back to verse 12 to understand what this relates to. Because what we all know is that this is not kind of some kind of miracle working prayer that if you pray in the name of Jesus, anything will be done. We can all agree on that. Um, it's not some kind of magic formula where as long as we say that then in Jesus' name at the end, anything will happen and we will see whatever we pray for. No, it's not like that. We need to read the context of what Jesus is saying to understand why he gives this promise. Verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now, I'm going to get back a little bit later to what that verse actually means. But what we clearly see here is it's talking about a work that there is for the disciples. Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to the Father, but I'm going to leave you with a work, with a task that you're going to do. And to do that, you're going to need heavenly resources. To do that, you're going to need power from God. You're going to need something from me, and you're going to get it if you pray. If you pray and you do these things together, it's going to happen. And that's the promise of answered prayers in this, in this context, in this situation. Again, it's not some kind of magic formula that you can use whatever time. This is particularly about seeing the prayers answered when we seek to do the will of God in bringing out, uh, in doing the work that Jesus has tasked us to do. The other one I want to look at, the second one is in chapter 15, verse 7 to 10. And this is the piece in, in chapter 15 where Jesus is talking about him being the true vine. Him being the vine from which the roots come, from which the branches come. In other words, we're all part of him when we become a believer, when we become a child of God. It is talking about unity abide in me. Without me, you can't do anything. And in verse 7, he picks it up. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So what do we see here? We're seeing that there is an answer prayer when we abide in Christ, when, we, when we're in unity with Him. And how are we in unity with Christ? It says it very clearly. As you abide in me, you will bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Abide in my love, and if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So how 
are we in unity with Christ? How are we loving him and how is he loving us? It's by keeping his commandments, doing what he has said we should do. And where do we find this? It's in the word of God. There we find his commandments that we can follow. And then if we do these things and we pray according to these things, we will all see them happen because we're praying according to the will of God. Again, this is something new to the disciples because they're not used to this kind of praying. They're not used to this kind of, I'm going out there and I need the power of God to do the work of God and to obey His voice, to obey what He's telling me. And then lastly, we see in chapter 16, um, at the end of chapter 16, verse 23 and 24, where it's talking about, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. And this is in relation to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 16 is all about the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promising him, him is, he is going to come to convict the world of sin, of judgment, and um, of righteousness. And this is talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's saying... Until that time, <clears throat> you haven't asked him. But when he comes, then you will ask. And then you will receive what you ask for. So in the time of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide our prayers. The Holy Spirit will be there to help us in our prayers. And when we pray according to what the Holy Spirit puts in our heart, we pray according to the will of God. We will see our prayers answered. So if the disciples believe in him, this is Jesus' first argument. The first argument we draw from his teaching here is that when they believe in him, they will experience answered prayers because he has opened the way to the Father. And as they then live to serve him, to seek him, and to, to, to follow him, to, to follow his commandments, they will have their prayers answered and they will experience joy. Now, we know that our prayers don't always get answered. And we know that they don't always get answered maybe in the way or in the time we want them. But if we pray according to the will of God, if we pray according to what is promised in Scripture, if we pray according to the glory of God, as Jesus told His disciples in Luke 11, He said, May your will be done. Your name is glorified. Hallowed be your name, Father. His objective in His prayer and in His life flowing from that was a glorification, the glory of God. If we do these things and we pray that way, prayers will be answered in His time and in His way for His glory. So very important. This is a very encouraging message from Jesus for his disciples to say, you will experience answered prayers and you're going to need them when you're going to follow me, when you're going to do the work that I'm going to give you, when you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, when you're going to try and uh, when you're going to keep my commandments. And the disciples should be encouraged by this. And we should be encouraged by this because if it wasn't for Jesus, how would we know about answered prayers? How would we know how to follow Jesus? How would we know all these things? We need him. And we need to believe in Him so that we can see these prayers answered when we do the will of God and we seek to do the will of God. Secondly, Jesus is tasking them. He's tasking them with a, with a task, with work to do. And we're going to stick in John chapter 14 there, verse 12. The gospel ministry that Jesus is calling His disciples to embark on after His death and His resurrection. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Jesus is going to what to the Father. And that's why somebody else needs to continue the message. Somebody else needs to continue the work of proclaiming the kingdom of God, the truth of the gospel. If they choose to listen to what he is saying, to believe in him, they will do greater works than Christ. Now, they had experienced and they had seen many of the things that Christ did on earth. And this had become their daily lives for the last two and a half, three years. But what, is, what does Jesus mean by this? Somebody needs to continue the work that Jesus was doing, and even at a greater scale. Let's look at this verse more careful. It talks about whoever believes in me. That talks about all who believe. That's everyone, all the believers, Christians, and in this case, specifically the disciples. He's addressing them, but it doesn't only apply to them. It applies to all believers, not only certain gifted people or only the disciples. Now, why am I making this as a first point? It's because this verse, 
John chapter 14 verse 12 in many cases gets used by people as some kind of basis that for some kind of greater healing ministry than what Jesus has done. Where people say, now we're going to do greater healings than Jesus did. But that's not really what it's talking about. For on, on the one hand, because it talks about everyone who believes, and we know from Scripture, Paul writes about that not everyone does miracles. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, to verse 20, 29, it says, don't do all work miracles. And it says, no, not everyone does miracles. So we know that this verse is not talking about that because it talks about everyone, whoever, who believes in me. That talks about everyone who believes in him. So we know it doesn't talk about that. And on the other hand, we also can't... Jesus raised people from the dead. Can we raise people more from the dead? No, we can't. That happens. And it, when these things happen, it's a miraculous experience. It's a miraculous thing. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about everyday Christianity for every believer. And what this is talking about is, what did Jesus start when he came to the earth? His primary work was not the doing of miracles. His primary role was to come and to seek and to save the lost. And then to proclaim the message of truth, to reveal the Father to the people. And we, now that we've received the Holy Spirit, we can do the same. And that's why Jesus in, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said, Now that you have received the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witnesses to, Ju to, to Judah, to, to Samaria, and to the ends of the, of the earth. That's doing greater works than what Jesus did. We can't go on the cross to let, like Jesus did in a greater way and die and get resurrected. Our greater works are to go across the whole world because Jesus only really stayed in Israel. Our greater works, and the disciples started with this, with this through all of Paul's travels, um, is to bring the gospel, the good news of the Father, to everyone. That's the good news. That's the gospel ministry that Jesus is tasking the disciples here, here with. And that's what they are being called to do now. Now, why is this important? Why is this an argument that Jesus is using? He's saying, you've seen me do this. You've been part of me. You don't have to wonder anymore what you're going to do when I'm gone. This is what you're going to do. You don't have to wo worry anymore whether you're going to be a fisherman again. You are going to do the work that I'm doing at a greater scale. More people are going to be reached. More people are going to be saved. And you are, they, don't, they did see many miracles, but that wasn't the point of their ministry. That was just to validate they were speaking the word of God. So this is very encouraging for them. This is giving them comfort. This is giving them hope and perspective. And they see that they, in the next verses, just as we looked at this just now, in this, whatever they ask for, they're going to get. Whatever they ask for, they're going to get from Christ because he's now with the Father. And the power of God is going to be on them to do mighty works, to preach the gospel. We see this when, when Peter stands up at the day of Pentecost and he him not being learned, never practiced this before, he preaches a powerful message to a lot of people and 3,000 people get saved. That's doing greater works than what Jesus did in terms of saving people through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they are encouraged. They should be encouraged because they now see there is a there is a task ahead of me. There is work that I need to do. And I'm going to do that in obedience to Christ because he taught us everything and now we're going to do it. The next, the next one, the next argument that Jesus is making, and this is a, a message, this is a theme that is woven through these three chapters um, very, very strongly. And it's talking about unity. And a loving relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And for that, I want to stay here in chapter 14. We're going to read verse 18 to 23. Unity in the loving relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's talking about in verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. This is Jesus talking. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day... You will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him. And make our home with him. That's beautiful at the end. 
If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now before we unpack this, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the disciples again. Up until this time, the disciples' faith, their hope, their comfort, their everything was in the physical presence of Jesus with them, walking, walking the country of Israel, walking those roads, answering the skeptics. He was there. And his presence, his physical presence with them, his closeness and unity was their strength. It was their comfort. They had nothing else. They knew what were they going to do without him. Or like Peter says in John 6, uh, 68, when Jesus asks the disciples if they want to leave him, he says, no, Lord, where should, where should we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So all of their hope, all of their faith was in Jesus physically being, being with them. They saw him and he was close to them. But at the same time, their hearts weren't transformed yet. On the inside, they probably still knew fear and knew anxiety. They had sin in their lives and his presence, his physical presence with them would in many ways have calmed that and given them peace. But what now if they're stuck with their dirty, their brokenness inside, and now Christ, the physical Christ, even leaves them as well. How are they going to deal with themselves? And Christ knows this. He's promising them here to not leave them alone as orphans. Because he knows they're holding on to him for dear life. Instead, he's saying to them, I know you're going to need me, but my departure, he's saying, is better for you. It means a better form of unity with me. You're more closely connected to me. And why, how do we know this? It's because he will be sending the Holy Spirit. And then we will know that we are in unity with him. As chapter, as chapter 14 verse 20 says, In that day, and it's talking about the day of Pentecost, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, then starts living in the disciples. He's not only then around them, but he lives in them. He starts transforming their hearts. He changes them from the inside and they get a new perspective on life. And then what happens is they start loving him. They start loving him, not because he gave them something, but because their insides are changed. They start loving him. And that's what it talks about here in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. How do, we, how do we keep the word of God? It's only possible through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He changes our hearts to want to follow him, to want to keep what's written in the book of life. If our hearts are not changed by God, we're not able to sustain that. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. So it's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit coming to make a home in us. The moment our hearts are transformed, we receive the Holy Spirit. And we become a child of God. And this of course happens all on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus is making this promise to him because he says, I know you're going to need me. I know you're going to requ request, long for unity with me. And it's going to come. It's even going to be better, much better than what you know now. And that's, that's an, an incredible consolation, incredible comfort for us as believers. Is to know that we've got that unity with Christ. He knows everything. That's going on in our hearts. We've got a unity with the Father because Christ died for us, because He was risen, and He is now with the Father, and He sent His Holy Spirit. And this is a comfort, a comfort to the disciples, and it should be a comfort to us as well in times of trouble. To know that if we believe in Christ and if we believe in what He's done, and if we believe in what He's promised, that we will have that comfort and we will have that unity with the Father, a loving relationship, which is something we we all de desperately need every day. And then the last thing that Jesus leaves us with is an argument for this life to say, believe in me. Don't just believe in God as some kind of abstract thing, but believe in the person of Christ. He's saying, I'm going to leave you with peace. John 14 verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. A peace from God, from Christ, a peace from Jesus, who talks about this hours before he himself is going to die and is going to have to face death on his own. He is saying, 
I'm giving you a peace that nobody else on this earth, no people, no government, no money, no security, no face mask or hand sanitizers can give you. I'm giving you a peace that's beyond understanding. A peace that makes you calm during the storm, knowing that he who makes the storm is in control. A peace that helps us to be a witness during troubling times. And we need that. Because a lot of people don't know this peace. It's not some kind of experience or some kind of feeling, but it's a deep peace rooted in the person of Jesus Christ who died, who was raised from the dead, and everything he has promised has come to pass. None of the things he has said haven't come to pass. None of the things he promised would happen haven't come to pass. He is faithful, and that's why we can rely on the peace that he gives. And we know, of course, that the final experience, the, the ultimate, the most complete experience of this peace will be when Jesus returns and we will see his, his kingdom on this earth. and We're going to be with him. So Jesus makes many of these arguments and we've basically only touched on chapter 14, really. Chapter 15 and 16 is, is much of the same, but also a lot of new. It's talking about the unity of Christ with the Father. They believe in the Father. They believe in God. And now he's saying, believe in me. Why is it? Because he is the way. Because he is the answer. So let's look at why do, does Jesus want us to believe in him? And how does it relate to the life to come? The life that happens when we die, when our physical bodies die. And, and, and why is it important for us to believe in Christ for that time, for that future life? And how is that going to give us comfort and peace right now? And I want to look at two things. One is that he is the only way to the Father, who the disciples didn't know. And the other thing is, the second one is, there's going to be a future life. There's going to be an eternity. And that what we believe in now is going to decide and depend. That this is going to decide where we spend and how we spend eternity. So let's look at the first point. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father who the disciples don't know. And why am I saying this? If we look at, John, at, at chapter 14, Jesus is saying in verse 1, You believe in God, believe also in me. Now notice this, he is saying you believe in God. So he's addressing God, the Almighty God, the, the one they revere, the one they know from the Old Testament, the one they know for, from the Ten Commandments, the one who created the earth, the one they worship. And then, when Thomas is asking him, Lord, but we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 6 and 7 it is. So he addresses God for them as God, as the Almighty God, the God of the Old Testament. There's no relationship between people and God there. But when he talks about God, he talks about the Father. And he wants them to know that there is a possibility for them to have a relationship with the Father, to become a child of God, to become a child of the Father, where it becomes personal. Because in the Old Testament, his love wasn't like that. They had to deal with sacrifices to make provision for their sins. And now there is a possibility to experience the love of God in a personal way. This is very, very important. Jesus being here represents the Father perfectly. And what he's doing here, he's saying, when you know me, when you see me, you know the Father. And I can help you to get to know the Father. Look at me, believe in me, and then you'll know God as your Father. Something that was odd, that was foreign, that was new to the Jews. But Jesus is saying, I want you to know God as your Father. Because then you really know him. Now you only know a part of him. I want you to know much more of him. Know him as your father. There's another aspect as well to the relationship with the father. Many can come to, to know the father by looking at Christ, by seeing who Christ is, his mercy, his, his, his love, his tenderness, his compassion for weak people, healing the sick and preaching good teachings. And they can see something of God the father through that. But not everyone will have a saving relationship with the Father. That's only possible by knowing Christ as your Lord and your Savior. We see um, John talks about this in the beginning of his book, in chapter 1, verse 12, where he says, It is very important not just to know about Jesus, and by that we know who God the Father is. No, 
you must believe and receive. John verse John chapter one verse twelve. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is talking about receiving Christ. The light of the world, the Lamb who takes sin away. And then what? You become a child of God, so he becomes your father. In other words, up until that time, for the disciples, something had separated them from the Father. Until Jesus arrived on the scene. And what is that? It was sin. It was the sin that is in every person. Sin separated them from unity with the Father. And sin separated the disciples at this point from knowing the Father. They were facing some kind of trouble and uncertainty there in the upper room. But this is nothing compared to the eternal trouble, the the, the, the real anxiety, the the absolute state of not knowing where to look and what to do is when you stand before a holy God, you are not allowed to call him Father because you haven't believed in his Son, Jesus Christ. The biggest problem that doesn't compare to any trouble, any issue on this earth, is the, trouble, the problem of sin. And dealing with the problem of sin is impossible for us people. And that's where our real troubles are going to come from. Our real trouble, our biggest problem of sin is only going to be solved by believing and receiving what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. His resurrection out of the death. Because by that he made provision for our sins. He paid for our sins. He took the punishment. Like Paul said, he who, be, who knew no sin, he who hemmed, had no sins, he became sin for us. So that we become the righteousness of God. So that we are in right standing with God. So that we are not no longer uh, receiving judgment from God for our sins and that is what Jesus came to solve for that's the problem he came to solve and that's the real trouble he came to solve for so he's saying let not your heart be troubled you believe in God now believe in me because I am the way to the father you can become a child of God if you receive and if you believe in me very very important I'm going to read for us from John chapter 3, verse 16 to 21, a well-known verse, but it's very important because it's key, it's vital to the message of the book of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the son of god the only son of god and this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clear clearly seen that his works have been carried out in god a very clear message. The word believe and the word son are, are mentioned a number of times in this piece of scripture. Believe in the son of God. And then you will not perish, but have eternal life. And that's the last promise I want to end with. If we read John chapter 14, the first thing that Jesus says, after saying that our heart shouldn't be troubled, that the disciples' heart shouldn't be troubled, he talks about his father's house, about heaven. He talks about in verse 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What does Jesus mean here when he's talking about the Father's house and him preparing rooms for us and, and him saying that he's going to come again and he's gonna, and then we're gonna all find that place that he's prepared for us. What is he talking about? He's talking about what's gonna happen in the future. When Jesus is gonna come back out of heaven, back to the earth, and he's gonna bring all those who believe in him, he's gonna bring them back to heaven. It's called the rapture, where he's taking the church, he's taking everyone who believes in him, and take them back to heaven to be with him. And we know that heaven is a place where it's perfect, there is no trouble there anymore. There is no pain, there is no suffering, there is peace because we are with Christ, that we with God, and there is no sin in that place. This, this is not talking about the time when Jesus is coming to bring final judgment on evil, as we read in the end of, of, of Revelation, I think it's in chapter 19 to 21. 
This is talking specifically about when he comes to take the believers home to be with him. And this is extremely comforting because not only will we be with him again in perfect unity, but also there will be a place of no pain and no suffering. A place where there is no sin anymore and we will have peace. We will have joy. And we will know him fully. And what does this produce in us? What does this bring to us? It is a joy. It is a hope, a firm hope that we have in him. This is comforting for the disciples. And in many ways, it is so comforting that it almost produces joy. Like, like Paul would have said. Paul said in Philippians 1.23 that he said, It would be better for me to depart and to be with Christ than to be with you. He, said, he knew where he was going and he knew it was much better there than on this earth, in this broken world. He knew it was better there, but he said, Lord, may your will be done. It's better for me if I stay here so that the church can be built up and strengthened. Jesus himself said in, in, in chapter 14, verse 27, he says, um, sorry, verse, 20, verse 28, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. So when we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be. When we all see Jesus, then we will have peace. And Jesus is saying, if you only really knew, if you really understood what it's like to be with the Father, you would have been glad for me. You would have rejoiced with me because I'm going to the Father. But they didn't understand it. And Jesus is trying to teach them that it is better in heaven. It is better to be with God in perfect unity without sin and pain and suffering than to be on this earth. And that's the promise, that's the comfort that he's giving to us as well. And that is something that I want to leave you with. And, and, and I want to leave and I want to end off with the message that he brings to the disciples at the end of this long teaching, at the end of 20, chapter 16, before he's, he goes and prays off by himself. And then he's taken by the soldiers. At the end of chapter 16, Jesus says in uh, verse uh, chapter 16, verse 33, I have said all of these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that both means that in this world where we have trouble, we as believers can have peace, we can have joy, we can have hope. Why? Because we pray... And he answers our prayers. He will pray according to his will. We've got a task to do. And we're going to see mighty works of salvation. If we do the works of Jesus in, the, in, in a greater scale. Because on this earth we will have unity. And relationship in love. With the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And because we have peace. That's the promise he gives. Not a peace that this world can offer. But a peace that comes from God. He has overcome the world. What that also means is he has overcome. What is capturing the world which is sin he has overcome death by raising by, by being raised from the death by god the father he has overcome all of those things and now he's sitting at a throne in heaven and we look to him and we know that he has overcome the world and this is extremely comforting this is extremely uplifting and encouraging to the disciples so what is the one thing we need to do in times of trouble and uncertainty, is to believe in Christ. First of all, for the forgiveness of our sins, because then we will know Him, and we will know the Father, and we will receive the Holy Spirit, and we will have unity with Him, and we will be equipped and enabled to do the work that He has called us for. He is our hope for this life, and He is our hope for this life to come. Now, as we close, I, I want to encourage you, in this time that you have on your hands, Read these chapters. Read chapter 14 to 16 with all the context I've been trying to give you about where the disciples found themselves in, in, in an extremely uncertain, uncertain, anxious um, time. And read these chapters. Read them and, and think about them. Let them wash over you almost to comfort you, to build you up, to build your faith and to, to make sure that Jesus Christ is central in your life, that He is the one you put all of your hope in, that you do and go out and do that gospel ministry, that gospel work that he called the disciples and everyone else to do who is a believer in him. And I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will help you to, to understand it, to make it part of you, to let it grow in your heart. And, and, and I also want to challenge you. If you've heard this message and you realize 
you've never put your hope. You've never believed in Jesus. You've never believed in him to be the, the penalty, to take the penalty for your sins. You never believed him to really be who he is that he is, who he says that he is, the Son of God, the one who has been raised by God, and who is now who is the perfect representation of who God is. I want to challenge you, put your faith in Christ. Believe in him and you will be saved. It's not a maybe, it is a will be. You will be saved. You will experience the power of God at work in you as he forgives your sins, as the Holy Spirit comes and brings joy and peace and righteousness in your heart. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you um, for this time together as believers. We thank you that we can know you. Father God, we thank you that you are amazing, that you are great, and we thank you, Lord, that you've loved us. Oh, Lord Jesus, you've loved us, and that you've loved us at the cross, that you've loved us to come overcome death, and that you still love us from where you see us in heaven. Thank you, Father God, that you sent your Holy Spirit indeed, and that you're giving us power, you're strengthening us, and that you're giving us everything we need through that. Lord, May your will be done in these times. May your church be strengthened, encouraged, comforted. And may we grow in love and in unity for you, Lord Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.